suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one your real good lawyer has walked into the studio. David Whiting is here to answer your legal questions. One three hundred triple two seven seven four, and uh, we've got a few lines free. So if there's an issue that you, has been worrying you for some time, now's the time you can call, and hopefully we can help you. David Whiting, good morning. Good morning, Virginia. Any homework from last week? One. Okay. Charlotte. Charlotte was a lady who lived in Gisborne, and uh, between and Charlotte lives next to a either a. Uh, an itinerant, an, an intermittent creek, so a storm water drain, for want of a better phrase, and and uh, her view is that the water authority hasn't maintained it properly, and there's damage and flooding and all sorts of things. Mm. So the and the fence between the reserve and her property is damaged. Question is whose responsibility is it? And the Fences Act, which was amended substantially in 2014, essentially says that while the obligation to fence falls between owners. You don't regard a public authority as an owner if it's fencing a public reserve or a public park. So if you were if you live next door to the council depot, then there's an obligation to fence. But if you live next door to a public park, that that becomes your issue. So I think what Charlotte needs to do is work out precisely how that reserve is described. Yes. And if it's a public reserve, the fence is her issue. If it's not a public reserve, then the then it's an issue that she shares with, uh, in that case, it would be Western Water, okay. which is about to change its name to something slightly different. because so... they're, they're, it's. But I think it will still be, I don't know. I don't... So to, to whom or to what organisation should the first phone call be now that we've established this? Uh, I think I would be going to Western Water and saying, What's the um, how how does it appear on title? But it would also appear on her plan of subdivision from the time she bought. There would be an abutal shown on the title. Okay, let's start off with Alex, who's called in from Frankston. Good morning, Alex. How can we help? Hi, how are you going? Good, Good thanks. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I've um, had got some police paperwork. It's just like a charge sheet or some uh, to go to court for a minor offence. But the dates on the actual. Um, you know, the details of the chart, the date all the way through his role. And I was just wondering whether that was something that could make it void or whether, that, yeah, whether it's just, yeah, not, not even worth pointing out. Uh, it's the, there is a power or that the complainant has to amend the complaint. Okay. So, so roughly how many months ago is the date of the actual uh, the event? Eight of- uh, roughly, the, not precisely, yeah, roughly. Sorry, July, you never July know who's listening. Yeah, July 2020. Right. Well, um, you, there, you're at a really interesting point at the moment, Alex, because, um, and there have been a couple of cases on it, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but if you, the normal rule is that for these kinds of offences, they either need to be commenced within 12 months or not at all. So um, what you might be trying to do is make sure it doesn't get to court till after the 12 months and you might then argue that it's too late to amend because essentially it's a new charge. But there have been some court cases where the complainant, where the informant, the police yeah. officer, mm-hmm. has been allowed to amend. OK. All right. So you yeah. want, and it then be, do you have an alibi for the date and time that's referred to in the, in the um, summons? Well, I'm, 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 um, it was a- I went to the doctor, like, and got a letter to um, state the, uh, like, the correct date to why I attended the doctor, um, but I didn't know I haven't gotten out, like, so I haven't got it. Well, what you um, might consider, Alex, is there's also requirements about uh, if you're going to have an alibi, you are required to tell the informant what your alibi is. So if you've got uh, evidence of attendance at a doctor's appointment at 10 o'clock on the 3rd of July and it was, in fact... Uh, and that's when they allege the offence was. That might be something you do, but that will guarantee an amendment. Just before I let you go, quickly, Alex, uh, can you tell us what's on the charge sheet, or would you rather not? Uh, yeah, it was just it was um, it was a um, put a, it was like a um, not a, a breath test, the the, you the know, drug the, test, the drug test or whatever. Yep, and so I didn't do the secondary. Um, I didn't do the secondary. So you you refused yeah. it. Yes. yes. Okay. All yep. right. Well, um, good luck with the uh, the issue of the date. I guess you can try and run out the clock on that. Is that your is that your advice there, David? Well, if run I the were, clock if down. it was me, I'd probably try and run out the date. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, we can't encourage that kind of behaviour. Judy in Blackburn. Good morning. 
Good morning. Go ahead. Judy. Good morning, David. Um, employed a painter to paint a property, um, ended up spray painting the whole house and everything in it, including the carpets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. Thorough and, then. Sorry? Very thorough then. Did everything. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, all the tools that were inside and everything else, mantelpiece. So he stated to me when I went and confronted him about did you give the money back, but never saw the money. So I put in an application to VCAT and employed a solicitor to send him a letter demanding, you know, the damages back. Yes. He never responded to that. Got the VCAT application accepted, um, but when he received the letter from my solicitor, he changed the name of his company. Yes. And so I rang VCAT and informed them of this and they said there's nothing they can do because it's not the same name as on the application I put in. Judy, the um, when you have a business, you can either operate the business as a sole trader, so it yep. would be Judy as Blackburn from Blackburn uh, trading as XYZ, or it could be a company or it could be a partnership. If it is an individual and I think that's probably likely with a painter if it's an individual. The fact that he's um, changed his name from the best painter to the very best painter makes no difference. It's still him that's the respondent to the claim. Oh. All right, so the fact that he's changed his name makes no difference whatsoever. And yet VCAT is saying it does. No, 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 you're trying to change the name... You're trying to change the defendant. I'm saying that the defendant or the respondent, the trader, hasn't changed. The, your claim is against the person you had yep. the business deal with. That's right. That's, yes. Uh, he hasn't so changed you should name. continue your claim with the name that it was on the contract you had. Good luck with that. We hope it goes well. Jeff in Bendigo, good morning. Hi, David. Um, I'm just ringing up regarding um, I own a unit in a well known lane in. Um, the CDB in Melbourne. It's yes. on the first floor. Now, with uh, with these new extended dining hours, there's a couple of restaurants directly underneath, and um, I've had a tenant there for three years, and he's recently left because of the issue of the the noise factor, which continues late at night. Yes. Now, there's other other tenants in that building also have had the same issue. Now, there's rumours that this this um, extended hours will continue further. Um, obviously to promote, look, I'm not against promoting, you know, outside dining, but in this, it's a real problem because there's balconies there and I've mm-hmm. been there and the noise, yeah, it just comes right through. Jeff, it's, Jeff, you still... there's one level below. It's not so much, the, I've, I've not so much that the, the hours have been extended. It's still the same trading hours, but the diners are now sitting outside. Yes, sorry, yes. yeah. Yep. And also, um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh. Well, that, that's okay. I, mean, look, now, I've, I've I can imagine the Melbourne noise is Council. substantial. Yeah, I've written to the Melbourne Council and they've acknowledged it, but obviously no um, definite response. Okay. Um, and like I said, there's other tenants. Yeah, it's just the one floor. And it's, I've been there. It's, it's, a, it's very loud. Yeah, you know, it's just... All right, well, well, let's hear what David can Jeff, advise. Jeff, it's the... You still have the same rights under the Environment Protection Act in relation to noise. You, and because you're living in a unit with an owner's corporation, you may also have rights under the owner's corporation legislation against the tenant downstairs for allowing the noise to emanate. Now, part of your issue might be that because it's on the street and not in the unit, I don't know whether that would compl- make a change to your complaint, but because it's an owner's corporation, you will have rights under that legislation. So from the council's point of view, it's there, they'll be complying with their permit, but there may be issues in relation to noise under the Environment Protection Act, and there may also be uh, some uh, claims that you can make in VCAT about the uh, owner's corporation and the model rules. Right, because obviously the noise, it's a, I think above 35 decibels is, um, is an issue, but it's probably not going to be that. But it's just, yeah, it's constant, especially men talking. It's real, yeah, you know, it's quite um, very loud. So I, I personally that, don't have a problem with men talking, Jeff, but if you do, you do, yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of don't it's start quiet, me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, yeah, so at the end of the day, the, the best thing to do was go through the body corporate. Have a look today. at the model rules and, and perhaps start there.
Okay, good luck. Uh, I, I can imagine what the well-known lane is, although there's a number number of well-known lanes that now have outdoor dining and it's yeah, yes, par- uh, part of the uh, the attempt to try and bring some life back to the city. But this one was always going to turn into an issue for those who reside in the city, having everyone out on the street yes, and making yeah. a noise. Might be something we can raise with Sally Cat when she next joins us on the program. Angela in Hawthorne, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Good morning. Good morning. I have a, a, a lovely apartment with a, with a courtyard garden, a private courtyard garden, at a boundary fence with a neighbour. Now the problem is that the boundary fence also uh, is, a, is a very high one. It's built up to about four metres and the top half of it provides privacy for an upstairs resident from, you know, overlooking by the, by the neighbour. Yes. And um, it was always understood by uh, the owners in these apartments that the top half of the fence was the responsibility of the owners' corporation. And um, uh, we now know that the bottom half of the fence, the boundary between us and the neighbour, is is our responsibility. You yes. mentioned changes to the Fencing Act some years ago, David. Yes. These apartments were built about 20 years ago. But um, I just wondered if you had anything to say about the, the top half of the fence. And, um, OK, here's my guess, Angela, um, that your unit will be defined is th- in three dimensions. Yeah. So my guess is that the upper limit of your unit is your ceiling. Yep. yep. And if you look at the plan, you will find that you own the courtyard, yep. but only up to the same height as you own the, um, as as you have the inside of the flat. So you extend the plane yep. out yep. to the fence line. And without having seen your plan, I'm prepared to guess that that's what it says. It's probably about two, two and a half metres or so. Yes, right. Now, what that means is is that you have no responsibility. So what it would mean is is that your neighbour abuts common property. So my guess would be that above your the extension of your apartment line, above yep. your garden, will yep. be common property. So it's a boundary between the owner's corporation and your neighbour. Okay. Okay. So it's well, your starting point is the plan, and it won't. It's because you won't own four meters up. It's not your problem above your roof line. Good luck with that one, Lisa in Geelong. How can we help? Oh, good morning, Dave in Virginia. I just wanted to ask you about un, um paid super and I've had a claim through the ATO which I'm receiving money back from. Um, they only go back five years but um, of course I've worked there for 13 years. Um, I have all my documents going back right back to the 13 years and wondered whether I would be able to make um, an underpayment claim or something where I would be able to receive the, the, the superannuation for the you know, other So years you worked there for 13 years and they never yeah. contributed to super for you? Correct, because I was employed um, under a contract basis rather than as an employee. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so your starting point is <clears throat> to establish that you were entitled to super. Yes, and I've done that, and I um, am going to receive some money back because yes. I was I was meant to have been employed as an employee. <clears throat> No. So, uh, so, so what, what, what? Someone at the tax office has determined that, having regard to the circumstances of your employment, you were in fact an employee, even though documented as a contractor. Um, that, that's yes, about the I'm, way it works, right? Now, correct. if you want to pursue your superannuation prior to that, you will need to establish at a, in the magistrate's court in its industrial jurisdiction that for that period you were an employee. Yes. Now, sometimes people have a fight with a tax office and give in because the cost of the fight can be too high, but it doesn't mean that they're not prepared to have the same fight with you. Okay, then. So that's your start. I would be getting some advice from an industrial relations lawyer. Uh, about whether or not you were, and in fact, an employee for the period, and your argument would be it's a continuous period of employment during which period you didn't provide for me. So are you still there? Yes, I am. Then I would simply say it's an ongoing employment dispute and I want to be paid. Lisa? But, but it's not a tax office issue beyond the five years. Yeah, and uh, and Lisa's going to need some individual help there. This she is, not, is indeed. Yeah, yeah. Th- this is probably not one you can handle on your own, Lisa, so good luck. Uh, Rhonda in Geelong, what's happening there? Uh, good morning. Um, I 
want to know if I have any um, any what I can do about some impact noise. It's a new build that was completed in September. Mine is just a one bedroom ground floor unit with a two story um, unit above me, um, and in the complex, I'm the only only one on the ground floor. When I signed, it was off the plan. When I signed that contract, it showed. Uh, concrete subflooring between the two units, which extended right across to um, the other three units in the front, which created the um, garage yes. and um, to the cars. So, on my final inspection, um, I came in. Everything looked okay, and I. Um, paid my money and then when I finally moved into the unit that night there were tenants in the unit above and then I heard all this noise which was stomping and so when I looked up at that noise and things so it's all about impact noise the wearing of um, uh, the washing machine so now six months later because it was only September when I moved in end of September um, now the now there's creaking, so I'm assuming because it's laminate floorboards, um, so I'm assuming it's the joist or something. And when I've contacted the builder, they say it's got nothing to do with them. I've um, got plans from the Geelong Council that shows that there is no sub, um, no concrete flooring at all. Um, I, I would then, be I would be having a talk to the building surveyor, Rhonda, um, because we had a phone call last week, Mick from Port we Melbourne, did. who That's had right. a, a 1970s block of unit, the same issue as yours. Uh, yes. um, I'm, I would actually be wondering about the fire rating between your unit and the one above. Well, uh, apparently there is, it has met the fire rating. Um, I had um, a plumber look, pull down one of the lights and so there's certificates for all of that, for the noise, the fire, the... In fact, the electrician that came here, you know, to do with the NBN, um, he said that my unit cost more than the others to, because I had to get that fire rating. OK. Uh, Rhonda, you've, you've simply got, uh, as we spoke a moment ago to Jeff about noise in the city... It's yes. a noise issue from the... Na well, first of all, my question would be uh, whether or not it complies with all of the relevant building, building codes. And, yes. uh, and if it does, then they fulfil their obligations. Yes. So it then becomes a question of, well, how can I keep the noise down? I, I do know that it is possible to put insulation under the laminated floor, uh, but if they don't, then the, you've just got a, a, a noise dispute. It's kind of one of the problems you've got when you buy off the plan. And, and particularly with a lot of new apartments, I'm, I'm hearing many complaints but about this. That's no, no comfort to you, Rhonda. But yeah, a, a real problem with them. Well, that, that's what I was wondering. If because you know I couldn't actually see, and I know the clauses in the contract to say that they could change, but that was not visual to me, and so I, you know, signed it in good faith uh, or paid in good faith. But so there's nothing I can do. You, you, look, you may have some rights under the Australian consumer law over the quality of the build, but if it meets all of the regulations, um, what you're doing is you're coming along and you would be making new law to say, I bought a unit, but it's noisier than I thought it was going to be. Mm. Is uh, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to advise my clients to be second. I'm not really keen on advising them to be first. Right. I'm sorry we can't help you. There's nothing else you can advise then here in... Sorry, uh, just, just hang on one second. David, nothing else you can advise? No. no? Okay. Then I am afraid we're going to have to leave that there. David's got a parking ticket dispute in Doncaster. What's happening, David? Hello, Hello sorry. My name is not David. My name is um, Reza, R-E-Z-A. -E. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, go ahead, Reza. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, David and uh, Virginia. Virginia. I'm yes. just calling. I had a parking ticket over in Hawthorne. Uh, for the past six months, three three times, I'm I'm a trader. Obviously, I'm just going to work all over Melbourne, and I got the logbook. You know, wherever I go, I write my time. You know, um, just this is for myself. Where I've been, you know, wh what do they do? You know, where yes. do they work? So I got um, when when they booked me two times at the, that particular place in Hawthorne. When I checked my logbook, uh, it was on my. Uh, I, I, I checked my logbook with the ticket. It, it was matching. I just paid them off straight away. So this, the third time, you know, when I got the ticket, when I look at the uh, uh, parking fine, 
when I look at my logbook, I was not on that particular places at that day, you know, at that time. My, uh, Reza, I would be talking to the council. My experience is that councils now take photographs of the car with the parking ticket to as evidence of the date and time and location of the offence. So I would simply go back to council and say, show me the picture that relates to that incident. Show me the evidence and then you can take the argument either further or capitulate and, and realise that maybe you were there. It's, yes. um, they do sometimes get it wrong. Not often, but sometimes they do. Uh, Janice has called in from the peninsula. Hi, Janice. Good morning. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm wondering if it's possible to put the names of my adult children onto my, the title of my house. Yes, it is. Can I ask why you want to do it? Um, I'm just turned 90 and I'm doing some estate planning. Two of the children actually live here now. All and, right. Uh, if you want to, can I be really rude? What's your house worth, Janice? Pardon? What's my... What is your house uh, worth? It's, it's about two million. Rightio. Then in order to add your children to the house, you're going to be paying 90 grand in stamp duty. Whereas if you leave it to them in your will, you're not going to be paying anything in stamp duty. So yeah. uh, I, I think it's a, an estate planning type question. You could, uh, you may come along and say, I want to add two to the title, but two to the title, but not the others. Is someone going to contest my will? What do I do? But I can say that if you want to add them to the title now, you'll pay stamp duty on the transfer for, on the value of the interest being transferred. So if your property is oh. worth two million. Do it before the 1st of July because the stamp duty goes up on property worth more than $2 million on but, July 1. But, but if Janice does it before the 1st of July, she'll still be paying stamp duty? Well, let, let's assume $2 million. It will be $110,000 if she gives the whole of the property away. If she gives a smaller portion away, it will be pro rata. And by, by putting people on the title, you are giving it away. Is that what you're saying? Basically, yes. Right. yes. Janice, how does that sound? Do you want to pay that? And if, if no, I don't. No, and, I don't. And if you, in respect in, if you are in receipt of a Centrelink benefit you may end up losing your sum or all of your Centrelink no, benefit as a result. I'm a self-funded retiree. Okay, so that's not your issue, but for other people it would be. So it, 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 can, can Janice uh, achieve the same outcome by simply uh, including the, the children in her will? Yes, if that's unless there's going to be a con contest to the will where someone will argue that the particular provision is unfair. Um, yes, if everybody is sweet, then the answer will be you'll get the same outcome without paying the stamp duty. Would you right. do that instead, Janice? That's very helpful. Thank you Thank very you. much. Pleasure. Glad to be of help. Many more calls than we could get through. I was trying to rocket through them this morning, but still answer questions as much as we could. So we'll try again next week when David Whiting is here. I'll be away, but you'll be with Ali, and I'm sure you'll play nicely. Always. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. David Whiting, who answers your question and does so very generously each week, I have to say.